Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for Blue Water Cruising Association for hosting this event. So, solar. Luckily, solar is not too hard to troubleshoot. I walk through a lot of people for troubleshooting solar. The good news is, this is a typical setup, okay? We're gonna do just simply one panel, one controller, one battery. First step, if you wanna troubleshoot solar, and you're not sure what it does or doesn't do, is you would make sure that your boat has, and this is good, this is, oh, I even do this with some technicians, lots of owners. Because we sell panels, not just to our clients, but we sell them to other businesses as well. And I walk through a lot of technicians and explain to them that a solar panel is not gonna charge your batteries if your batteries are full. So I get alarm phone calls all the time when boats are connected to shore power, the batteries are full, and people are worried that their solar panels are not charging. And I remind people that that's a good thing. You don't want to be force-fed food if you're not hungry, right? You don't want that. And the job of the controller is to actually look at the battery voltage and say, you know what, I don't need to do anything. We're at a float voltage, the batteries are full. There's no need for me right now to charge the batteries. We're at a flow charge because there's, I don't know what it is, but we're at 13.4 volts and the batteries are full. So if you connect a solar panel suddenly to a battery bank that is completely full, don't expect your solar panel to be at maximum output because if it was, in a week, your batteries would be fried, right? That's the job of the controller and I'll come to you. The job of the controller is to limit and decide if it's good to have solar recharge the battery at any given time. Okay, so the first step I tell people is like, you want to maximum, you want to see if you're what maximum amperage output you can get out of your solar panels. The way to do that is to have your battery banks in a depleted state of charge. So bring your battery down to 75% of capacity, 80% of capacity, don't have a battery charger on, don't have your alternator on, and then suddenly the solar panel is going to see a depleted state of charge and it's going to say the batteries are at 12.4, let's say, I need to do something. Because then it's gonna wake up, it's like, there's a problem, I need to help. And then it's gonna say, let's use the sun to bring this battery back to 100%. But that will only happen if it senses a low voltage. If it senses a full voltage at 13.4 or 13.8, this thing is gonna come online and it's gonna say, I don't need to do anything. The batteries are full, stand down. I have six solar panels on my boat, six controllers. I have a methanol fuel cell. I have a battery charger, and I have a high output alternator with an external regulator. So I have nine charging sources on my boat. I've left an anchorage after four days in an anchorage, which I do, I go to Easter for five days, four days, and I stay generally in one anchorage for four or five days with friends. We come back and underway, my engine is obviously running, my alternator is running, my solar is running, if it's, if it's running, regardless if it's sunny or not, there's solar. So I'm going to have six controllers running and I'm going to have my alternator running. And generally, because I was able to stay there for a long time, I had my methanol fuel cell running. So there's a, there's a methanol fuel cell, so now I'm at eight charges. And then I might plug into the dock. All of this is still on. The engine is running and I might plug in to shore power while the engine is running as I'm sort of bringing the boat down and we're going to leave the boat. So it does happen in April that I'm going to have nine charges, sources of power, recharging my battery. All of them are actually voltage regulated, which is good news because otherwise none of this would work. They're all independently looking at the battery voltage and they're making a decision, should I help or not, based on their own algorithm. And their algorithm is if they were all set to 14.4, and maybe they're not because some of them might be more precise than others, but if they were all perfectly even, the controllers are all even, they all know what to do. The charger I was able to configure exactly what I want to do. The alternator I was able to configure because I have an external regulator, and my EFOI I was able to do. So they're all going for a target voltage of say 14.4. <coughs> they're saying we gotta do something. The battery voltage was, and they're coming online, and if let's say the solar was on first and it brought the voltage to 13, the alternator comes online, it's like 13, that's too low, I gotta do something. Brings up the voltage to 13.6. The methanol fuel cell clicks in and says, because I have a big battery bank. Methanol fuel cell comes online and says, I got to do something. 13.8, that's not, you know, maybe that's not good enough. Comes online. 
Battery charger comes in, is like, I haven't been on for a while. As soon as I wake up, I gotta bring those batteries to absorption. I got I gotta do it. That's my that's what I've been told. I gotta bring them to 14.4. That's what I do. I bring them to 14.4. All of them come on online. The rate at which what's interesting is let's say they're all online now. How are they gonna peel off? Are they gonna all peel off in unison? Or are they gonna peel off one first and other ones? The ones that are the smartest are generally gonna be the ones that are gonna peel off first. Because those are the ones that are asking quickly, should I do something, should I do something, should I do something? It's like the keenest kid in the family is the one that's gonna help mom and dad the most. Right? Mom, you need help, you need help, you need help. The other brother that's not asking as often is simply not gonna carry as much load because the first one is asking mom and dad constantly, do you need help, do you need help, do you need help? They're gonna say yes. Now he's also gonna be the first one to get off. Because if the other kid is on and he's not asking if I need to help or not, the keen one is saying, I need help. I need, and mom's like, no, no, we're good. Because the other one has it now. So the one that pings the battery, the frequency at which it looks at voltage, the fastest, is going to be the first on, first off. The one that is the slowest to look at battery voltage is going to be the last on, last off. And that's why you don't see all solar controllers log on at the same time because then there's a factor of distance. Some controllers are further than the battery than others, right? And so then there's a factor of distance. How far are they from the battery? And so it really depends. That's a pretty winded long answer. It depends. But the one that pulses the fastest is the one that is going to be first on and first off. And the one that does it the slowest is going to be last on, last off. So that's why you can't expect all your controllers to do the same thing. They're not synced. They're independently controlled. And independently controlled, is that a good thing? To not have one brain decide everything? Damn straight that's good. Because you take one device out, the other devices do it on their own. Honestly, it's like a Terra cell. That's what it is. You have distributed leadership. You don't want to have, you take one down, then everything falls apart. And then what's the point of having intelligence everywhere? Like they're little robots, all doing their own little thing, independently of each other. They're only caring about voltage, and voltage is the only thing that matters. And that's how I get to install on some boats multiple chargers. Like on your boat, for example, Pete, you've got two inverter chargers. That's not unusual, a boat of your size, not unusual at all. And you'll, you can pull that off because in the back in the day, if they were converters, you could have never done that. And that's where the old adage is in the past of you can't have an alternator at the same time as a charger is they would ping so slowly that the voltage would creep out and then you'd have voltage spikes. But nowadays they're all very voltage regulated very quickly and you don't have voltage spikes. So the one way to test this solar panel is the first thing is you would disconnect it from the solar controller and you would measure what's called the open voltage. You literally put the leads at the panel and you would see what's the open voltage. You measure that number, okay? You write it down. Next up is then you connect it back to this controller and you, well actually before you reconnect it, you measure what is the voltage at the controller before the solar panel is connected. We want to confirm that that controller is connected to the battery. And the way to do that is measure voltage at the controller. If there's no solar at the controller and you have voltage at the controller, the only way you have voltage at the controller is if it's connected to the battery. Because a solar controller cannot, again, like a TV, TV can't be powered if it's not connected to an outlet. So that's how you do that. You connect, confirm that this has power to the battery. And then when this has power to the battery, and you connect this to this, you check what is the output voltage. What was the different voltage before connecting the solar panel and after connecting the solar panel? And the way of connecting and disconnecting a panel, you never do it under load, i.e. you never disconnect a shore power breaker from yanking it from the wall. You put a blanket on top of your solar panel in the sunlight and you disconnect it or disconnect it. Well, if you're not from the fuse, you don't pull the fuse. Well, you could do the fuse is fine, but not, not a, it's, better, it's better not to because that's still not quick. While you're playing with a fuse, it's not instantaneous. Our skills at breaking a circuit with a fuse, a circuit breaker is instantaneous, practically, right? I mean, it's in milliseconds. But when you're taking a fuse out, you might be ee, 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 ee. like that's seconds. So the way to disconnect, you never disconnect a charger ever, like a solar panel or an alternator. You put a blanket, you disable the solar panel, then you can disconnect it. It's like when I was a kid, I remember all the bad things. My mom was so patient. 
She'd tell me to help move the vacuum, and instead of going to the cord, I'd yank it from the wall while it was still running. And there'd be like arc flashes, right? I did that, of course, never learned, right? Of course, because, I mean, I was an idiot. But when you're doing that, you're actually causing a, like, literally a chemical change in that joint. You're causing a huge voltage spike as you disconnect something, right? As it's trying to create, continue that circuit. You don't want to have any arcing on your boat. Things are pretty valuable. My mother's vacuum was valuable, but I didn't respect it because it wasn't my own. But I'm telling you, this is your boat, so you better do it right. So disconnect and connect a solar panel with a blanket on top. And now you give me all those numbers. To you, it might not make sense. You send it to a technician somewhere who sold you the panel, and you give that data, and then they'll be able to tell you if you've got a problem or not. And that's how you troubleshoot a solar panel. Okay, methanol fuel cells. Conceptual diagram here. Methanol fuel cell, um, pretty straightforward device, luckily. It's got an input, voltage sense. It's got an output. And the input to run one of this is a methanol right here. Like anything, sounds silly, but I'm going to say it. You know, uh, I get calls about uh, people with methanol fuel cells asking, Jeff, help me troubleshoot. The first thing is, is the unit actually turned on at the remote panel? Do you have it off or automatic? First thing. Good point. The other one, too, and it happened is the fuel tank. You know, is it full of fuel? Do you have fuel in it? And we even had one problem one year where the fuel tank was there, but the fuel pickup line had actually fallen from the top of the fuel tank, like right at the lid. And when you shun the flashlight in, you actually saw that the pipe was actually at the bottom of the tank. So we learned that one year. We're like, oh, the fuel pickup at the top of the fuel fill up or fuel pickup was actually disconnected. And so that's why the EFOI was not working. Generally, um, it's an overheating problem, right? We talked about that briefly a little bit. Uh, methanol fuel cells definitely need some ventilation to work. And if they don't have ventilation, um, now in the wintertime it's easier because our boats are cooled, but in the summertime when it's really, really hot and if it's in a closed lazarette, like on my boat, I actually open the hatch to let the air out. In the wintertime, it's fine. I've never had overheating in, this, in the wintertime because again, the, the surrounding water around our hall is around 10 degrees, 7 degrees, 11 degrees Celsius, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's cooling down the boat quite a lot. So the lazarette where this is mounted doesn't have to worry about in the wintertime, but in the summertime, if the water is 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, or 20, 22 degrees Celsius, then you've got that plus the ambient temperature that's warmer, and then it makes a difference. So you've got to have adequate ventilation. You've got to have a good fuel pickup. And other than that, it's super straightforward. Um, the other thing, too, that I want to mention is that if you have it installed in an engine room, don't run it at the same time. Some instances, we've actually done that, although the manufacturer says you can't, but at one point, you eliminated all options and you've got to do something. I remind that to people also. I say, no boat exists in reality than, other than paper. If you followed every manufacturer's recommendation for your boat, of every product on your boat, a boat cannot exist. It can't. Like you look at VHF antenna placements. You look at all the requirements that everything wants in terms of distances between X and Y. It can only exist in theory and not in practice. So a boat is about finding compromises. Living in a world of black and white is not a place to be on a boat. If you want a world of absolutes, you should not be a boater. A boater is a place where you make compromises and decisions and you make the best decisions with what you have. And it's like that with navigation. There is no clear right or wrong. And sometimes you're left with no other choice. You try all the other alternatives and you say, you know what, it can't fit anywhere else, but I need this device. So I had one owner, we put it in the engine room and he knows that he can't run the EFOI when the engine is running because otherwise it's going to overheat. It's not ideal, but where else are you going to put it? There is no other place. And we definitely looked. Okay? Anybody here in the room might have any questions with EFOI. It's a pretty straightforward unit. Yes? Go ahead. The question was, have I ever noticed a EFOI not shutting off when another charge voltage comes in? No. Uh, I've, and I have one on my boat, and it actually pulls off pretty quickly once the alternator comes online. 
unless the batteries are really, really depleted. The batteries are really, really depleted, and my alternator is charging, but it's only got the batteries to 12.8, 12.9, because I started charging at 12.2, but my battery bank is huge. It takes a long time to recharge my battery bank. Yes, the EFOI, but the EFOI will generally be one of the first things to come offline before the alternator. So it's actually going to pull off. Is an EFOI smart enough to know how to regulate voltage, when to start charging and stop charging? And the answer is yes. It is voltage regulated. So you can set the parameters. Yeah, that's correct. The other point that was brought is you can set the parameters. It's either on, off, or automatic. And even an off is a conditional off. You know, if you have it off and your batteries go down to a really low battery voltage, it's actually going to turn itself on to save the batteries. So I think at other... Even in the off position, but correct. also on the advanced setting, I think you can set the, the start charge and the end. That's right. And then you can go in automatic, you can even customize it. Yeah, yeah so it is, it is absolutely voltage regulated and you can set it custom and it's pretty smart. To be honest, it's one of the reasons why I like the EFOI is that my boat is on the Sunshine Coast, far away, about three hours away, two hours and a half of driving if there's no traffic, and the ferries are good. And I'm not there in the wintertime all the time, unfortunately. Like, I haven't seen my boat in now six weeks, seven weeks. And one of the things that helps me sleep better is that my methanol fuel cell is there in the background, and if I lose shore power, which can happen and certainly happens in the wintertime, my EFOI always has a fuel tank in the winter, and it's going to basically keep my batteries more than topped off and maintain my batteries even if there's no battery charger on the boat. And even if it's sunny and it's snowing. Because I don't expect any solar output when my solar panels are covered in snow. <laughs> a methanol fuel cell is a single output device, like an inverter charger. Therefore, it only maintains the battery it's connected to. If you have a battery combiner, as I have an echo charge on my boat, a directional unit that is only 15 amps, it also, if my house battery gets a charge, my engine battery gets a charge. So I'm about to have an ACR put in, so this could work in the Correct. An ACR would, and also that was your point, an ACR can help to share a charging voltage to another battery. And so you can have a single output device, like a methanol fuel cell, like an alternator, like an inverter charger, like a solar panel, right? And you can have that charge shared with other battery banks via battery combiners. Question was, could you keep an EFOI to maintain a car battery? Yes, you could, but it's way too expensive. I mean, this is, you know, $3,500, $5,000, $7,000 Canadian. It makes no sense. You'll just replace your battery every year for a very long time before you recoup that cost. We want to be financially savvy here. We're boaters, right? We're always reasonable with costs. We don't spend more money than we need to. Better to do that is to buy a small solar panel on a trickle charge, right, to do that. And you see that all the time in parking lots, like, uh, like uh, not parking lots, but storage lots. They'll have, you know, maybe a tarp on top and they'll have sewn a solar panel. I saw one guy, he did it with duct tape and there's a wire going back, you know, under the hood. And so the solar panel's on top and it's getting a little bit of a charge through a controller to the battery. And that's how they're doing that. AC, DC generators. I wanted to recap, we did talk about chargers, but it's good to just sort of think about this again. You know, Jeff, my generator is running and it's not charging the batteries. Why? Well, let's go down a rabbit hole together because there's a lot of moving parts from starting a generator and recharging a battery. And this is what's involved. You know, think about this. Your AC generator has, on it has literally a circuit breaker right here. That could have blown, first step. Besides the fact that your generator could be a problem, that's the first thing. But let's assume it's perfect. You've got a circuit breaker here. Next, if you've got a source selector switch and it's rather old, they sort of become grumpy over time. They don't work forever and they start giving grief. They work sometimes and they don't work sometimes. Trick is to actually turn it really hard, like hard over, hard over, and you start, it's almost like exercising. You know, work it out, stretch it out. So you might actually end up moving your source selector hard over, like super hard, thinking you're gonna damage it, to just kind of like make the contacts better. And that's a sign for next time you're in port to change that switch. That switch is expensive. And then, then it goes to the panel. And then the panel, you need to have a double pole breaker and energize to energize the panel. Then you need to have the converter. By the way, that's common. Eh? I cannot stress that enough. 
Most people don't understand that a battery charger needs to be enabled to charge their batteries. I know it sounds silly to some of us, but it is very common. Very, very common. I come on boats and the battery charger breaker is off. And the reason it's off is because the alternators Pardon, the alternators are relatively keeping the batteries charged if they're running the boat often. So they're not really noticing that their batteries are drained because they're using the boat frequently. But in the winter time when they're not running the alternators, maybe once every three months, two months, that's when the batteries are really aging. And that's the owners that their batteries are changing after three years of the battery, their batteries are dead. And they're like, why the hell, what happened? Well, they never had it on a charger. Even though they had a charger, they never turned it on because they didn't think they needed to. People are looking for dramatic feedback. You know, they're looking for something's absolutely wrong, but they don't realize that a converter, if it's not on, the battery can still do the job. It's just going to have a much shorter life. So having the breaker on is really essential. Having a charger actually seeing lights on the charger, we talked about that. You got to see some side of input. And then the input, you need to make sure that your fuses are still on and or connected. And the other thing too is that this is how it should be. But remember, how many battery chargers are switched? Lots. So you could have your battery charger and your switch is off and you think you don't need those and the reason they're off, like your engine battery, and you don't realize that if you have your engine batteries off, your battery charger is not connected to your battery, connected to the load side of the switch. It energizes your engine panel. Like I've seen owners where they literally have the engine battery switches off with the charger on, they turn the ignition key on, they all the gauge light up. There's no power coming from the battery, it's coming from the charger. Then they go to start the engine, they can't. Can't start a charger with a starter with a charger. The voltage drops, and then they go back again. They're like, what the, f what the hell? This is insane. Start again, voltage drop, what the, this is crazy. And what they don't realize is their battery switches are off, and they didn't know they were off because they turned the injection key on, and there's actually voltage at the panel. Magic. Not magic badly wired, right? You can't have a battery switch off and have your engine panel energize. If that does not freak you out, my God, you could live in a haunted house. <laughs> and look how simple a DC generator is, right? It's like an alternator. That's all it is. Super simple. Question? Yeah, 98% of us are going to have AC generators on boats. Very few very, very few. Practically no power boats are going to have a DC generator. Not that they shouldn't. Habits die hard. Eventually, eventually, and this is going to happen and it's starting, boats are probably not going to have AC generators in 10 years, 15 years. Most boats won't unless you have a big boat. Everything is going to be DC gen, everything going to batteries. It's already starting and everything is going to be inverter based boating. So you always run your boat off inverters always for whatever you want and you run a generator recharge batteries and that's all you do and there's already a trend going that way and this is happening up to about 80 90 footers we're doing that on 90 footers now i've got battery banks on even i've done 100 footers that have battery banks that are massive massive like we're talking like like this like 15 feet by six feet of just batteries and the whole boat can run off inverters right so it's happening it's coming Smaller boats are doing it, 30, 40 footers are doing it all the time, right? Sailboaters have DC gen, they'll have the Panda, they'll do it all the time. It's going to come. Because not a lot of us have to run large AC loads for a short period of time. A lot of us are doing it just to run a charger, right? And if you could, I'm doing that on a lagoon right now, we're going to be running the water maker, which is AC off of an inverter. So you can start running if you have a large enough inverter, you can run a lot of stuff when you want without the sun of a generator. And so then you run your generator just to recharge batteries. That's all you're doing. Everything else runs off from the batteries. Gives you a little bit more flexibility. But for the most part, this is the world we live in. Anybody who's got an AC generator, that's the world they live in. So remember, it's not simple. That's the point, right? It's not simple. So you just got to chase it down. One step at a time, okay? Any other questions on generators? Battery combiners, you got a house battery and an engine battery, and it's a way to share a charging voltage from either battery. So whenever it senses on either this post here or this post here, a charging voltage, it says land of plenty, let's share.
right? Pretty straightforward. And it, never seen one fail. Ever, ever in my life seen a battery combiner fail from any manufacturer in my life. So they're very reliable. <clears throat> What happens is the fuses protecting those devices end up being either undersized or because the battery banks are uneven and there was a very crazy uh, difference in state of charge, the moment those two batteries were in combine, the influx going from the high battery, the battery with a good voltage, to the dead battery was so severe that it exceeded the 120 or 300 amps that you would have thought would have been reasonable. Because some people think, oh, if I've got a 50 amp alternator, and this is a common error, they'll say, I've got a 50 amp alternator, the maximum amperage that can ever go to this battery bank, or vice versa, is 50 amp, because that's all the amperage that could ever go here. What they're not thinking about is uneven battery banks. Like I was talking about hydraulic, hydroelectric hydro electric dams. The moment you have a differential in water level, the bigger the differential, the more power is generated, right? And so people think the limiting factor is the charging source thinking, oh, you know, my inverter charger here, for example, is 150 amps or 100 amps, therefore this will never see more than 100 because how could it? You know, it can't. Where is it going to have more? Well, it's going to have more than 100 amps if the battery banks are un seriously uneven. And especially if you've got a battery bank that is massive, right, and a other battery bank that is smaller, then that battery might be doing everything it needs to do to just fill that battery back up. And with that high inrush, the fuses end up blowing. So, you know, as an owner of a boat, what I always like to emphasize is you should be able to confirm if things are working or not before they don't. You should be curious. It's time to not troubleshoot, but to confirm behavior when things are working. Like for example, when you start your alternator, in a short amount of time, <coughs> once you've started your alternator, you should be seeing a delta, a voltage difference on your house battery. Your alternator is going to start, it's going to rise that voltage above 13.3. Once that battery gets to 13.3, this thing is going to say, good, let's share. And then your house battery is going to get a charge. You want to confirm that that works. You want to know because you want to see, yeah, now I know my combiner, how it works. I see it work. And next time, every time you start your engine, and I do that on my boat because I have an echo charge, mine goes from alternator over here back to engine battery. I always look at my engine battery voltage prior to starting the engine and after starting the engine. And I'm looking for a nominal change. I want to see a delta. If I was at 12.6, I want to see something. If I was at 12.2, I want to see a rise. If it doesn't rise, either my echo charge fuses blue, something is broken, or my alternator is not working. But something's wrong. I got to figure it out. I'm always looking to confirm behavior. And if you don't care, you can do that. But the challenge is, is that sometimes that battery isn't, doesn't even have a voltmeter on it, right? Like a battery thruster, for example. How many thruster battery banks have voltmeters connected to them? Practically none. You know why? Because people that install thrusters aren't electricians. They're general boat people. General boat people don't think about electrical systems because they worry about general stuff. One of the most common things we do in audits is say to people, if you've got a battery bank, every battery bank should have a voltmeter. Every single one. You need to know what the state of battery is. Is that battery getting a charge or not? And so what we end up doing is either we'll put a little voltmeter near the thruster battery bank up front or we'll run a wire all the way back to the voltmeter panel. And you know on voltmeter panels you, don't have, a, you have a little toggle switch and you can say battery 1, battery 2, battery 3, battery 4. So you're not buying a different voltmeter. You're just simply having the wire go to the switch and you say position 4 is thruster battery bank. And you want to confirm that when your alternator is running that battery is getting a charge. And the way to do that is by measuring the voltage. And you've got to be curious. And if you're not curious then one day Remember, you know how thrusters die or windlasses die or starters die? Are they badly produced or alternators? Especially starters, windlasses, and thrusters. They don't die because it's a production error. They die because they're undervoltaged. Right? That's how they die. Windlasses die because of low voltages, thrusters die because of low voltages, and starters die because of low voltages. So now changing a thruster is a pretty expensive affair. If you value money and your time, you do not want to change a thruster. 
Thrusters are not cheap, not cheap at all. And you could lose your thruster because you don't have a way to recharge your thruster battery bank and you're hammering your thruster because it's a pretty scary docking situation and you're all hands on deck and your thruster will do whatever you ask of it until it dies. And remember how at the beginning we were talking about wattage divided by voltage equals current? And we had an example of a 1200 watt windlass divided by 12 volts equals 100 amps. And then we said, oh, well, if you divide it by 13.5, it's 89 amps, right? Higher voltage means lower current. Well, the inverse is also true. If you divide a 1200 watt, let's say, windlass divided by not like 12 volts, but 10 volts, that's 120 amps. And a windlass is not meant to run 120 amps. The current breaker, and a lot of the breakers are not properly installed, they might not trip and you're running it really hard. And that's how thrusters die, because they're worked hard on low voltages. Hence why, when you have a battery combiner, you should have a voltmeter on every single battery that's connected to a battery combiner, so that you can confirm the behavior that when your charger's turned on, and I do that every time I leave my boat, <coughs> I make sure that whatever I turned on, I see battery voltages that are charging voltage, I, an increase in voltage from before I started the charger and after. On my boat, my alternator can take a hell of a long time to recharge the battery bank, and for some hours, if my battery bank is really depleted, my engine battery is not getting a charge at all through an echo charge because it's not sensing it. It's like, I'm not a 13.3. We're not there yet. There's no time of plenty. Even though my alternator is running, my alternator is running, but it's not enough voltage to trigger that to think that there's enough voltage to chair. And that's the beauty with a battery isolator. That's why I love battery isolators. And guess it's on my hot list for my boat. Hence the perfection thing that I was talking about. It's a never ending story, right? I'm always chasing it. Echo charge was the right thing. And then battery isolators come out and I'm like, God, I need one of those. Question is, given a choice, why would one choose to have an alternator choose a house, which is a large house battery, at the expense of not having your engine battery get a charge while the house battery gets a charge? Great question. Yeah, there's a good reason. If you have your alternator, a large alternator connected to an engine battery, and this, by the way, happens. So I learned from all of your mistakes, by the way. Thank you. Okay? Honestly, all of you, thank you. No joke. I learned from all of us. That's, that's, none of this is in a manual. They don't write this in the product specs. Large alternator, battery bank, really large battery. Watch what's going to happen. And this is real. Alternator charges that in an instant brings that battery voltage to 13.3. Instantly. No problem. 13.3 comes here. My God, land of plenty. We're at 14.4. No problem. Suddenly, this senses, let's close the circuit. Let's allow current to go through. As soon as the moment that this lets current go through, and it's connected to a battery that it's a 12 or 12.2, that's huge, that's eight times, 10 times that battery pack size. The voltage drops, 12.4, 12.5. This senses 12.5, let's open the circuit. Then this closes, wait 30 seconds. Senses 13.3, oh, it's good enough. Let it through, shut off. This ends up going on off, 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 on off. And you hear them clicking in the engine room. It's constantly going on and off because as soon as I put them in parallel, the voltage drops below 12.8. Hence why I don't have a high output alternator on the engine battery. The real one that needs it is this. And honestly, an engine battery on most boats, diesel boats, draw almost no power. Engine panel, if you have a blower, sure. Fuel pump is nothing, and it's fine on its own for a few hours. And if I'm really worried, then I'll do a manual combine. Like I'll just force them to be together for a period of time, because I have an on-off parallel switch. We talked about it yesterday. This is the isolator, right? The great thing about an isolator is that it will never have more input than the output of an alternator, and output of an alternator is known. A 100 amp alternator will never give you 200. It's just never, it's never gonna happen. A 100 amp alternator will always give you 100 amps and never more, but if anything, less. 
This is deterministic. We know exactly what that is, right? So then I know what this wire size can be. I know what this wire size can be. I know what this wire size needs to be. I know what this wire size can be. I know what this fuse is. I know what this fuse is. I'm done. There will never be nuisance stripping with this setup, ever, ever. You put it in, you don't even have to worry about it. It's guaranteed. You'll never have any surprises with a battery isolator to share an alternator. The battery combiner can share a fuel cell, can share a solar controller, can sell a wind turbine, can sell an inverter charger. Right? All these devices can go here and then back here. But an isolator can only do one, can only do an alternator. So to share an alternator amongst multiple battery banks, in the past, some designers would choose to do it, although it was a very hard decision. They would do diode battery isolators, but they were very efficient. You would lose 0.7 volts. But for reasons of automation, you would do it, but it was a painful decision. You would choose automation at the expense of losing a huge percentage of your alternator output for automation. When you have an isolator, do you need a combiner? Not necessarily if your only source of charge that you're wanting to share is your alternator. For example, if you had a multiple output battery charger here, right? You could have one lead going to the house battery, another lead going to the engine battery, right? In this setup here, battery charger, multiple output, they both go to each battery. The battery isolator is doing the exact same thing. The exact same thing. It's going one input to two places. So this setup is perfect, right? Honestly, it's perfect. And maybe you have solar here, but then this won't share solar there. But your engine battery doesn't need to have a charge all the time. It's not like your house battery, right? It's the land of compromises, right? Land of compromises. Yes, Jonathan? There is no such thing as a device that limits current. You do not have a single, other than a load, right? A load limits current. But there's not a single choke point that says, you can let 70 amps in, but nothing more than 70 amps. It's fuses, circuit breakers, all those devices are on or off. There's not a single device that says, I'm only going to let a certain amount of amps and no more. That does not exist. So yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, generally when they fail, it's the device itself that fails. I haven't seen an ArgoFET fail. I've seen a Pro Mariner ProSol charge fail. They had a model and that was giving a lot of grief and we had a lot of pain, but it was the device itself failing.